On today's early edition at 6, with the nation's rival parties at odds over a bill that would open up a full investigation into April's ferry disaster, the interim chief of the main opposition party finds herself on the hot seat. The presidential office says it won't get involved. And the signs are everywhere. They all point to a global economic downturn, and that could mean a very bumpy road ahead for the export-reliant Korean economy. Outside of Korea, the U.S. President Barack Obama vows to hit back against Islamic State militants who beheaded an American journalist this week. Stay with us for these stories and much more. It's 6 in the evening on Thursday, August 21st here in Korea, live from Seoul. I'm Nae hyun -gyung. And I'm Daniel Che. Thank you for joining us. Well, the standoff persists between family members of the victims of April's ferry sinking and parliament. Mm -hmm. The bereaved families are calling on lawmakers to renegotiate the specifics of a bill that would set up investigation into the ferry accident. With these new developments, the main opposition party's interim chief is finding herself in a rather sticky situation. Mm. Our National Assembly correspondent Jim young gil starts us off. The acting chair Park young sun of the main opposition New Politics Alliance for Democracy failed to persuade fellow party members and relatives of the Seoul ferry victims to accept the compromised ferry bill that was produced with the ruling Senuri party on Tuesday. The interim chief has not been able to win the backing of her own party, and some lawmakers have even distanced themselves after news broke that the families were dissatisfied with the agreement. The ruling party has kept a firm stance, saying further negotiations are out of question, and the opposition party's hardliners have sided with the victims' families who oppose the bill, saying it lacks investigative and prosecutorial powers. The interim chief Park, also in line with the ruling party, made it clear on Wednesday that renegotiations are not an option. Lawmakers from within the main opposition are divided on how to resolve the current crisis. The acting chair faces the prospect of intense backlash from within her own party, and it is feared that the opposition could be hurt more if the party fails to win any concessions from both the ruling party and family members of the ferry accident victims. Left with no choice, interim leader Park has asked President Park Geun-hye to meet one of the victims' fathers, who has been staging a hunger strike for over a month to help break the deadlock. However, the presidential office has distanced itself from the bill, saying the special law on this held of ferry incident is a matter that needs bipartisan agreement within parliament and is not an issue President Park can help resolve. Kim young Arirang News. Well, President Park seems to have had other plans in mind for this Thursday. She visited the Korean and U.S. soldiers currently taking part in joint military exercises with the commander of the Combined Forces Command, General Curtis Gaparati, in attendance. The president spoke about the need for the allies to prepare for any type of security threat or natural disaster. Some 80,000 Korean and U.S. troops are participating in this year's Ulti Freedom Guardian drills. The South says the computerized command and control training is strictly defensive in nature, while North Korea considers it a war game. President Park also visited the Capital Defense Command today, making her the first Korean president to do so in 23 years. Now, in line with the U.S. pivot to Asia, the U.S. Navy has unveiled plans to expand its number of ships deployed in the region over the next five years. The so-called navigation plan laid out by Chief of Naval Operations Admiral Jonathan Greenert calls for an expansion of the U.S. fleet in the Asia-Pacific from 50 to 65 ships by the year 2019. Washington also plans to increase its presence in the Middle East from 30 to 40 ships over the same period. This document covers fiscal years 2015 through 2019 and serves as a guide to the top Navy officers' budget priorities. 
The U.S. Treasury's point man on North Korea sanctions is currently in Seoul. He is here for talks with senior diplomats of South Korea. Officials say David Komen and Seoul's top nuclear envoy, Hang Jung-guk and Lee kyung su the deputy minister for political affairs, reviewed the current status of economic sanctions against Pyongyang by the international community. And they discussed ways to work with countries like China on the issue. Cohen is also said to have requested Seoul's cooperation in sanctions against Russia, citing the Ukraine crisis and the recent shooting down of a Malaysian passenger jet. And a former high-level U.S. official has warned North Korea against pushing the boundaries with its provocations, saying a war would mean the end of the regime. In an interview with South Korea's Yonhap News Agency, former director of national intelligence Dennis Blair said the North Korean regime would be wiped out by nuclear weapons if it first attempts a nuclear attack. He added North Korea is well aware of this and knows there's a limit to how far it can go. The former intelligence chief also mentioned that North Korea will conduct another nuclear test whenever it wants to create a threat in an attempt to extract concessions out of the U.S. and South Korea. The entire world is appalled. Those are the words of U.S. President Barack Obama over the beheading of American journalist James Foley by Islamic State militants. The Pentagon says there were attempts to free American hostages in Syria earlier in the summer. Connie Lee reports. A spokesperson for the Pentagon has revealed that the United States attempted a rescue operation in Syria earlier this summer, not only to free U.S. journalist James Foley, but also other American hostages being held in Syria by Islamic State militants. It was a secret, major rescue operation launched by U.S. Special Forces against the Islamic State. The Pentagon statement on Wednesday said the operation involved air and ground components, but did not succeed because the hostages were not present at the targeted location. This new information came as the U.S. launched a wave of new airstrikes against Islamic State targets in Iraq. On the same day, President Barack Obama, in a televised statement, said the U.S. will be relentless in the fight against the militant group following the brutal murder of Mr. Foley. President Obama, who said he was heartbroken over the incident, said the U.S. will do what's necessary to see that justice is done. He also compared the militant group to cancer, whose spread must be stopped. The president's message came less than a day after the militants released a video of the American journalist being beheaded. The Islamic State is believed to be holding several American hostages, including journalist Stephen Sotloff. Connie Lee, Arirang News. And over in Gaza, diplomatic efforts have failed, triggering Israel and Hamas to pick up where they left off before a ceasefire began. The rocket fire and airstrikes have resumed. Hamas says three of its leaders have been killed. Our Kim Min-ji has more. The airstrikes and rocket attacks between Israel and Hamas resumed Wednesday as efforts to come up with an extended ceasefire broke down. The Israeli military said it carried out 92 airstrikes in response to 137 rockets shot into its airspace since the truce talks broke down, which both sides blame on each other. Hamas says an Israeli airstrike on a house in Gaza killed three of its leaders, including the wife and infant son of Hamas military commander Mohammed Daif, who survived the attack. In a televised statement, Hamas military wing warned of further rocket attacks on Israel, including its main international airport. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has promised to continue his campaign against Gaza militants with all means and as is needed. Only a guarantee of the calm and safety of Israeli citizens will bring an end to this operation, and therefore I will continue to operate with firmness and insistence. Operation Protective Edge is not finished, not for a minute. We're talking about a lengthy campaign. Egypt expressed regret over the end of truce, adding that it will continue to try to secure a long-lasting one. The UN Security Council also voiced concerns over the resumption of fighting, calling on the parties to return to the negotiating table. The conflict, which broke out in early July, has left at least 2,100 people dead. Kim min Irang News. The Korean government has confirmed that one Korean national was killed in Wednesday's massive landslide in Hiroshima, Japan. Foreign Ministry spokesperson No Gwang-il says there were two Koreans residing in the affected area. 
One died and the other is seriously injured. Seoul plans to offer aid to the families of the victims reported to have been a Korean couple in their 70s. A month's worth of rain in Japan triggered the landslide between late Tuesday and early Wednesday, killing at least 39, including a rescue worker. Foreign Minister Yoon byung se expressed Seoul's condolences to his Japanese counterpart Fumio Kishida on Thursday. They say one day in Japan. We're all digging deeper, getting to the bottom of stories that impact your life, talking with you on air and online, connecting you with experts on the world's most pressing issues, news and current affairs at its best. With Na Hyung Young and Daniel Che. Arirang News. Arirang News. Arirang News. On early edition at six. Indicators coming out from different parts of the world seem to be pointing to a global economic downturn. Geopolitical concerns in a variety of hotspots are adding to apprehensions, making it difficult for the export-driven Korean economy to gain much momentum. Song ji reports. Latest reports by the Korean government and economic research institutes reveal that most of the world's largest economies are showing significant downside risks that could drag on Korean and emerging economies as well. The Eurozone, which accounts for 17 percent of the global economy, failed to grow at all in the second quarter from the first quarter. The gain in consumer prices in the Eurozone also marked the lowest level in nearly five years at a mere 0.4 percent. Both indicators show a typical double dip phenomenon, meaning the European economy showed weak signs of recovery, then fell back to a slump. Japan's stagnant economy is expected to remain in the doldrums for another few years, with exports not rebounding enough to bolster its economy and domestic spending continuing to shrink. Japan's economy contracted 6.8 percent in real terms in the second quarter, the lowest level seen since the devastating earthquake and tsunami three years ago. Citing officials, Bloomberg reported that Japan's central bank could slash its 2014 growth outlook to less than 1 percent with many private economists predicting growth rate of less than 0.5 percent. The Japanese central bank has already revised down its growth forecast for this year three times. The U.S. is the only bright spot, with its GDP logging a 4 percent growth in the second quarter. But its momentum can largely be affected by the slowing demand from the eurozone and a widely expected decision by the U.S. Federal Reserve to raise its benchmark interest rate in the coming month. Crises in Ukraine, Iraq and Gaza also have the potential to derail the global economic recovery. That could spell a tough road ahead for the Korean economy, which relies heavily on exports. Song ji Arirang News. And moving on, July was a good month for Korea's tourism industry, with 1.3 million foreign tourists visiting the nation. That's up more than 12 percent from the same period last year, according to the Korea Tourism Organization. Now, the biggest rise was seen in Chinese visitors, whose numbers grew 22 percent, thanks in part to the growing popularity of Korean television programs there. More Russian tourists also made the trip, taking advantage of a new visa waiver program. The total of Japanese visitors went the other direction, though, dropping 17 percent. By the end of the year, the tourism organization expects 13 million visitors to have come to Korea, besting last year's figure of 12 million. The number of people suffering from Alzheimer's disease in Korea is expected to skyrocket in the coming decades, and so are the costs for treating it. The National Assembly Budget Office's report says the number of people 65 and older who have Alzheimer's disease will jump from 1 percent of the total population in 2012 to nearly 6 percent in 2050. If the trend holds, the cost for treating all those people in 2050 will jump to 4 42 billion dollars, an estimated one and a half percent of the country's GDP. Now, because early diagnosis can help reduce the costs, the report calls on the government to promote regular health checkups for the disease and increase the number of health institutes that specialize in treating dementia. Shifting to a different subject, mathematics can be a scary subject for some. It was once considered a reserve of the academic world 
But Korean researchers are trying to let the future generations know that math theorems are also being applied in everyday gadgets and devices. Our Kim ji -yeon reports. The application of math theorems provides an important foundation for the advancement of modern technology. 3D printers, one of the most promising inventions of the 21st century, are based on a calculus theory known as Fubini's theorem. Introduced by Guido Fubini in the early 20th century, it states that in order to materialize an object with n level dimensions, one can do so by piling up the matter of n minus 1 dimensions. If it wasn't for Fubini's theorem, it would not have been possible to intricately pile layer upon layer to produce a three dimensional object. The rudimentary alternative is to take a large object and sharpen it. But this method cannot produce the sophisticated designs like those made by 3D printers. Due to its growing importance, Korea has increasingly tried to find ways to nourish local mathematicians, and has been making significant progress in the field over the past 30 years. Korea ranked first in the International Mathematical Olympiads in 2012 and has maintained a top seven ranking since. A number of math dissertations from Korea have been published in academic journals overseas, putting it at 11th in the world. However, Park kyung -ju, professor at Poang University of Science and Technology, says there's still a long way to go in terms of promoting the quality of research. He's emphasizing the need to create a conducive environment for local mathematicians. Okay. So they tend to do research that are, that, whose results are kind of predictable or, or they, they know for sure that they can, you know, they can solve. Okay. Instead of actually challenging uh, the, the real the, the problems they can actually make impacts. Because the, the problem is the whole research infrastructure, including grants opportunities, pro promotes that, that mindset. The winners of this year's Fields Medals, which are among the most prestigious awards in mathematics, underscore the importance of quality education in nurturing young mathematicians so that they can experience and appreciate the beauty of the subject and stay the course. Kim Jeon, Arirang News. Language and cultural barriers, some of the fear factors that made some Asians hesitant to leave their homelands and move to another Asian country for work and perhaps a better life. But that trend is apparently changing. Our Kim Hyun Bin explains why. The number of people moving from one Asian country to another has risen dramatically over the last 10 years. According to the UN 2013 International Migration Report, released on Wednesday, roughly 20 million Asians migrated within the continent last year. Many are leaving their homelands in search of work, others because of marriage. As countries in Northeast Asia, like Korea and Japan, suffer from the effect of low birth rates, a labor gap has emerged. It's being filled more and more by cheap labor from South Asia and Southeast Asia. Some 2 million Southeast Asians and South Asians moved to Northeast Asia last year for work or international marriage last year. That's nearly double the total from 2000. And looking at Vietnam alone, over 17,000 Vietnamese migrated to Korea in 2000. By 2013, the figure has soared to 120,000. While Northeast Asia has seen an influx of immigrants, its numbers pale in comparison to West Asia. Some 13.5 million people migrated from South Asia to the west of the continent last year. They're making the move for similar reasons. Middle Eastern countries may be rich in oil, but they also have relatively small populations, requiring them to look outside their borders for hard labor. That's opened the employment door for people from India, Pakistan, and Sri Lanka, who have seized the opportunity. The number of Southeast Asians moving to the Middle East for work has also risen, with the number last year falling about 2.8 million. Kim Hyun Bin, Arirang News. Well, if you haven't heard about the ice bucket challenge, it means you haven't been online lately. Well, I guess I've been online for too long. I've been seeing many of them, videos <laughs> of celebrities and even world leaders tipping ice cold water over themselves. It's going viral every day, every second. That's right. And the challenge has made its way into Korea as well. Our Konsoa tells us what the cause is for. Charity can be so much fun. The ice bucket challenge is going viral around the world. All you have to do is dump a bucket of ice water over your head or let others do it for you within 24 hours after being nominated or donate 100 U.S. dollars to the ALS Association. The association helps people suffering from amyotrophic lateral sclerosis or Lou Gehrig's disease. 
Once you have been nominated and drenched yourself, it's your turn to choose three other people. And it's the more fun when the most well-known people in the world take the challenge. To you all who challenged me, I do not think it's presidential uh, for me to be splashed with ice water, so I'm simply going to write you a check. Or not. Uh, yesterday was Bill's birthday, and my gift to Bill is a bucket of cold water. Now I nominate Ellen, Barack Obama. The internet is full of clips of people like Tom Cruise, Lady Gaga, and others not only showing their down-to-earth side, but tipping ice-cold water over themselves and donating to a great cause. The challenge has also made its way to Korea. Actor Chu Win-sung grabbed the headlines when he nominated a baseball player of the same name. Former pro basketball player Park seung il who has been battling with Lou Gehrig's disease, took the challenge in his own way with snow spray, which touched many people. Although there is some criticism that the challenge makes light of such a serious illness, it has fulfilled its main purpose of raising awareness and tens of millions of dollars. According to the ALS Association, donations have rocketed to 31.5 million U.S. dollars in less than a month, compared to the under 2 million dollars raised over the same period last year. Kwon Soa, Arirang News. Well, people in Korea had to break out their rain gear over the past few days. We've mm -hmm. been hit with an unexpected round of heavy showers that are forecast to last at least one more day. At least one more day. Our Kana Kim explains what's behind the torrential downpours and how much damage they've done. Monsoon season is officially over, but you wouldn't know it by looking outside over the past few days. Heavy rain pelted the central region on Thursday morning, prompting the Korea Meteorological Administration to issue its first heavy raining warning of the summer for the capital Seoul. An average of 45 millimeters fell in the morning alone, which is more precipitation than was recorded during the entire dry monsoon period in mid-July. And it's not quite over. By the time Friday is up, the central region is expected to receive up to 120 millimeters of rain. Other parts of the peninsula have not been spared. Further south, several landslides and damages to farms were reported in Chungcheongnam-do province, and traffic was restricted in the city of Daegu due to flooding. The Weather Administration attributes a torrential rain to cold air from the north colliding with hot, humid air from the south, which has caused instability in the atmosphere. The nationwide rain is expected to stop Friday afternoon, but another round of precipitation is expected starting from Sunday. Connie Kim, Arirang News. Well, the heavy rain alert that was in effect here in Seoul is now lifted, but as we said, more rain is in the forecast. Well, let's turn to our Michelle Park at the Weather Center for the latest. Michelle. Good evening. The heavy rain is over for now, but it's still sprinkling on and off here in Seoul. Now, we are expecting more rain, though, tonight and tomorrow morning. Up to 50 millimeters are forecast to fall, while up to 70 are expected in some regions of Gangwon the province. Now, there are still some heavy rain warnings and advisories in effect in some areas of Gangwon the province and Chungcheongbuk the province. So, for those of you in these areas, make sure to be stay updated with the weather forecast. Now, as for tomorrow's temperatures, we can expect them to rise back into the 30s for some regions and look forward to the mostly cloudy skies during the day. Now, going over to our temperature readings, Seoul will top out the Friday morning at 21 before reaching up to 29 in the afternoon. Meanwhile, the southern cities such as Daegu and Busan will top out at 30 and 29 degrees. Now moving over to other regions, Jeju Island tops over to 27, while Tokyo hits 23, and Mangkungang tops out at 27. Well, that's all for now. I'm Michelle Park, and back to you guys. Thank you for that, Michelle, and that's all we have for this hour. Thank you for staying with us to our viewers in different time zones. Have a wonderful day. This has been Daniel Tre. And I'm Nai Hyung Kyung. To our viewers in Korea, have a great rest of the evening. Our next newscast is at 8 p.m. Korea time. Daniel and I will be back tomorrow.